Righty. So we're continuing a theme of uh, PLT-based talks started off by Dave. Um, he introduced simply typed lambda calculus, and I want to build on that a little bit. Um, so, quick, we're studying. <laughs> um, I, I just want to start by like giving us a refresher on the notation that I'm going to use throughout this talk. So here's sort of a, a BNF style thing um, that I'm going to use to describe syntax. So we're going to say that there's a thing and it can be made of stuff or it can be made of more stuff. If you're writing some code, this would correspond roughly to an algebraic data type uh, or an abstract class with many constructors or something. So I'm going to describe the syntax of languages using this kind of thing. For things like typing rules, I'm going to use a uh, natural deduction rule. So below the line, we're going to have a conclusion. And above the line, we're going to have many assumptions. And uh, this will generally correspond to some kind of function uh, where the assumptions are sort of subcalls. Sometimes they'll be recursive calls. And it's not, quite sh it's not quite apparent which things will be inputs and outputs, but I will later on uh, clarify, clarify it in a way that you can actually translate these into uh, code. And I'm going to introduce a data type or a construct with a syntax. We're going to have contexts. So they can either be empty contexts or they can be something with a variable and a type. So they're lists of pairs of variables and types. I'm also going to often name context with a capital gamma. It's the hook thing. You'll see it later on. And here is a common conclusion that we'll be making. Uh, it says that given a particular context, a term has a type. So I'm going to quickly refresh us with what simply typed lambda calculus looks like. We have types. So types can be functions from types to types, or they can be Booleans. Terms, we've got variables, annotated lambdas, application, true, false, and Boolean elimination. Here are our typing rules. Ba -ba. So uh, we've got variables, uh, annotations, applications, some axioms for true and false, and uh, if then else. I would like to hope that everyone's roughly comfortable with this uh, before we move on, uh, because we're going to go a bit more complex. Does anyone have any questions about natural deduction? Cool. So here's a simply typed lambda calculus term. It implements the not function, like Boolean negation. Can anyone guess what the type of this term is? Bull to bull, nice. It's, it is. Now, I kind of consider it a burden that I have to annotate all of my lambda calculus functions. Um, in fact, if I got rid of that annotation, would you have any more trouble in figuring out what the type of this function is? So I, um, I personally wouldn't because I would look in the body of the function. I'd go, oh, it's a lambda. It's got to be a function from something to something. I'd look in the body. I'd see that the if returns a Boolean. And then I would see that also that that first argument to if, that has to also be a Boolean. So I would sort of conclude that this has to be a function from bool to bool. Um, so it's, I, I don't think that we need to annotate all our lambdas. So let's start to extend our simply typed lambda calculus with uh, an unannotated lambda term and see where that gets us. Let's write a typing rule for it. So here we've got sort of our inputs to the rule, uh, a context and some unannotated lambda term. We're going to use that information to type the body of the lambda. But in contrast to our annotated lambda rule, uh, I have to wonder, like, what is the type that I'm going to attach to that x when I put it into the context to type the body? I just don't know. It's, it's like an unknown, a placeholder. But if I had that, then I could 
type the body of the lambda, and then I could conclude that the lambda has some, some function type from something to the type of the body. And so this is going to be the process of type inference. We're going to have a bunch of unknowns for our types, and we're going to figure out what they are based on information we learn later on when we're doing type checking. Type inference. So the first thing I'm going to do, well, is see if anyone's particularly uncomfortable or has some burning questions. No. All right. The first thing I'm going to do is introduce this new syntax, um, this new conclusion, because I like it better. Um, this is going to say that given a context and some term, we infer a type. And I have that arrow there to, inf um, to emphasize that it's like constructing a term from the context and the term. I'm sorry, constructing a type from the context and the term. Uh, it's a very left to right kind of thing. And here we clearly have inputs and outputs to this judgment. So given a context and a term, create a type. Uh, and this will be helpful in uh, if you wanted to figure out how to translate some of the stuff that I present here into actual code. So some of the simply type lambda calculus rules are already type inference rules, like variables, uh, annotated lambdas, and the types for true and false. That stuff, uh, it's the types of all of the type information is already there. But the three other rules, um, we're going to have to do some extra work to say how to infer those types. So here's the modified, well, here's uh, we're at an annotated lambda term, right. Um, here I'm just going to show you like how to read this in an algorithmic fashion. So given this natural deduction rule, you can fairly easily translate it into some actual code by reading it clockwise. So we start with the inputs on the bottom left. Uh, here is an input of a context and a term. It's an annotated lambda term. We're going to break up that term and recursively call the infer function. But that's what we're doing. We're, we're solving an assumption, but we're also doing a recursive call. We're going to synthesize a type from that recursive call. And then we can use the inputs that we used, the inputs that we got at the beginning of the whole thing, together with the stuff that we generated from the recursive calls above the line, to provide a final answer for this inference rule. So I'm going to first extend our language a little bit more because we need some more machinery to actually do inference. The first thing we're going to add is this thing called meta variables. Uh, I call them meta variables and not variables because they're not to be confused with type variables as some of you might know them. These are just variables that are going to stand in for types during type checking, but once we're done type checking, I don't want to see a meta variable. And uh, the program is never going to use them. And here I've extended the syntax of types to include meta variables, but only during type checking. Here is our updated lambda inference rule. Uh, I've replaced the question marks, uh, the unknown, with a new meta variable, which I've sort of denoted with uh, this question n. I'm just saying generate some new meta variable that we haven't seen before. So let's just read through it. So we've got some inputs, context, and an unannotated lambda term. First, generate a new meta variable. Then, type the body of the lambda where the argument is at that type meta n. Now we can generate a t, and we can conclude that it's a function from meta n, whatever it was we generated, to t. There are two more rules we have to cover. So the first is applications, and I'm going to have to introduce some new machinery, but I think it's really, really cool. So we're going to start with some inputs, an application term. First, we're going to infer a type for the f, the function part of the application. We're just going to call that s. So I'm not going to assert that that left argument, that f, is a function type just quite yet. 
I'm also going to infer a type for x, the argument part of the application. And here's the cool bit. Uh, first, generate a new meta. Then, constrain the type of f to be equal to an arrow from t to that new meta. Uh, this is because if you, if you like sat down and thought through this for a while, you would realize that we don't actually know what the return type of some, any function application is going to be until later on. Uh, but here, at least, we, uh, this constraint will first make sure that f is a function type, and then it'll give us uh, a placeholder to figure out what the return type of the function is later on. So we'll see how we solve these constraints, and that's the unification part of the talk. There's also another rule that we have to do. Oh, yeah, right, this is the last bit. You have to pop out that meta because uh, it is the return type of that function, and so the whole term is going to have uh, meta n. The, the last rule that we have to do is the if rule. It's a little bit simpler. So we have our inputs. We're going to infer a type for b. We're not going to assert that it's a Boolean yet. We'll do that with a constraint later. Infer a type for the true branch of the if-then-else. Call that t1. Infer a type for the false branch of the if. Call that t2. Now we're going to do some constraining. Constrain that the condition type was a bool. Constrain t1 and t2 to be equal. So in our original rule, we just we said that um, if then else was well typed if uh, the true and false branches had exactly type t for some t. Here's how we're doing that sort of dynamically in an inference setting. From that, we can conclude that the whole thing has type t1. Or T2, this constraint's going to ensure that T1 and T2 are exactly equal. So it doesn't matter which one you pick. So we're going to go back to our um, Boolean negation function and sort of run through a proof tree and see, uh, see how those constraints sort of bubble up and how this actually lets us get to the right answer. So since we were wrapped in a lambda, the first rule we're going to apply is uh, the T lamb rule. So our x was actually a b, and the body of this function was if then else. Now that we've sort of sorted out the inputs to this function, we can go up and start doing stuff. So the first thing we have to do is generate a new meta variable. I'm going to say this is the first meta variable we've ever generated, so I'm going to generate meta zero. Let's just call it something. Now, we're on to the second assumption in the deduction rule. So we're going to jump up the proof tree and do inference for the if b then else, if b blah 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 term with uh, b in the context at meta zero. So here's our rule, t if. First thing that we need to do is make sure that our context has been updated properly. We have b at type meta zero. Uh, b was just called b. The true branch had false, and the false branch had true. We've sorted out our inputs, so now we're going to go clockwise around again, starting with uh, that rule, this one. So we have to do a variable t var rule application. So our context, remember, it had b in it, and our variable was called b. Now, the type of b in our context was actually meta zero. So we're going to update that as well. And now we've inferred that b has type meta zero given that context. Now that we have an answer, we can update our proof tree a little bit more. The answer to that inference problem is going to be meta zero. Right, next one. T false. Well, the only thing we really have to do here is update the context, but that doesn't really change our answer. It's just bool. So T1 becomes bool. 
Next one. Same thing, but for true. T2 becomes bool. So we've done all of those things that had uh, typing rules. We're down to these two constraints. If I just go back there so you can see those two constraints there. We have a constraint that meta zero equals bool and a constraint that bool equals bool. And as simple as you might think it is, I'm going to just put them aside and we're going to remember all of the constraints that we see as we do type inference and we'll solve them later. Now that we have an answer, we've done, we've gone through all of our assumptions and we have an answer for the inference for the if then else. We're going to go back down the tree and update the relevant outputs. So T becomes bool. Now we have an answer for this whole problem. It says meta zero arrow bool. We also have the bunch of unsolved constraints. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve them now. Done. They're already solved. Uh, it's, it's that bool equals bool is like a tautology. It's just trivially true. And we can consider that meta zero equals bool is already solved as well. So we're just going to substitute meta zero for zero, meta zero for bool in that type. And we've inferred the type of the Boolean negation function. So the next thing that we're going to cover is how we actually solve those constraints. Before that, does anyone have any questions? Um, uh, it's, well, I mean, does it, n I don't, I don't know what you mean by does it normally go from top to bottom, like, the conclusion, it, I think it depends on your perspective. Yeah, sure, sure, the problem is that when we're actually figuring this stuff out, all we have is the conclusion, and we've got a reason backwards. Uh, like, if, so I, I said to you, infer the type for that term there at the bottom, um, I, I can't really look ahead to see what the top of that proof tree is, but uh, yeah, so uh, oh, yes, okay, I get you. That is a like that's a legitimate concern. and I've deliberately structured this well, I didn't, the smart people who invented it. Um, there's a, there's a term called syntax directed, which means that for every term, you only have one corresponding rule that can be applied. So yes, it is a problem when any particular conclusion has multiple rules that can apply to it. It makes things complicated. So we deliberately, uh, we rig the game so that that can't work. So we're on to the unification part. So I'm going to give some prerequisites for what you need to do unification. I'm going to do it on types, but you can do it, anything, do it on anything that has sort of things that look like this. So it's going to have some base constants, like in the type language, we're going to have like ball, int, string, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's going to have some compound uh, types, I'm calling them, things uh, that take arguments. So we could have arrow, that's, got a, that's a two argument thing. Uh, list, that's a one argument thing. Either, that's going to have two. I'm sorry, this is very Haskell-centric. Um, and it's going to have meta variables because we've already seen we need we need things to stand in for uh, the concrete base types or compound types. And the process of unification is going to take a bunch of equations and it's going to figure out how to instantiate all of the variables, the meta variables in there to make it a tautology. And if it's not possible to make them a tautology, like in that uh, second or third, well, second example, we'll get to the third one later. Uh, if it's not possible, unification has to say no. So the way that we're going to uh, present the solutions to a system of equations is through what I'm going to call a substitution or a solution or a unifier all interchangeably. But what it's going to be is a function from metas to types. So this 
substitution maps meta zero to ball and it maps meta one to a thing and all of the other ones that we don't care about I'm just going to say that they map that meta that input meta to the output meta and I'm going to write a shorthand up here uh, where I only map the stuff that I care about and just assume that all the other metas are mapped to themselves just because it's a lot easier I don't want to write out infinity cases since substitutions are functions we can apply them so here's what it looks like to apply uh, this substitution s to meta zero I just have that squiggly arrow there to say that's what it evaluates to so if I feed meta zero into s I get out bool if I feed meta one into s I get out meta two to bool and if I feed anything else in I just get that thing back out again I'm also going to introduce some sugar I'm going to say that substitutions can be applied to types as well and what that's going to mean is that all of the metas inside that type should be run through that substitution function so there's no metas inside bool so if I substitute on bool I just get it back out again but there are some metas inside meta zero arrow meta zero and I'm going to look up meta zero in that function for both of them and substitute accordingly same with meta one arrow meta two except that meta two on the right hand side of the arrow is one that we don't care about so it got mapped to itself and one got replaced with the cool stuff and a cool little thing is since I've defined uh, substitution on terms on types whatever uh, you can define an identity substitution where all metas get mapped to the type that is that meta and you can also define composition of substitutions uh, s2 after s1 is substituting s s1 onto something then substituting s2 onto the result of that and there's a bunch of cool like categorical connections for unification which I won't talk about at all here so more formally we're going to say that some substitution s is a solution or unifier of an equation x and y when applying that substitution to the left hand side gives you exactly the same result as applying the substitution to the right hand side sometimes I'll say s unifies x and y so we're going to try that now we're going to do some unification in our brains what's the solution to this problem it is the substitution that maps meta zero to bool like that but it's kind of misleading that I ask you what is the single solution because there are actually lots of other solutions where we map metas that we don't care about to other things that we don't care about like this because meta one and meta two aren't in that s prime and s double prime are all valid solutions to this equation and we kind of want we want our unification to infer some kind of canonical answer so after so on we come to this definition of most general solution slash unifier uh, in English the most general solution is some solution where all other solutions can be factored through uh, a particular substitution in math speak it kind of looks like that if f solves some equation e then for all solutions s prime uh, there exists another there exists another solution such that uh, s prime factors through so this is this well, we can actually see some examples uh, in the case of s it is the most general solution for this set of equations it factors through identity um, and s prime factors through this extra one right so we'll map one to bool meta one to bool and then we'll do s and we end up with s prime and the same for this one bunch of stuff we don't care about uh, I, I'm not quite 100% sure on like the theoretical awesomeness of why most general unifier is needed but it does make things nicer uh, and here's another property that like we really want which is idempotence it is just saying that a substitution kind of does all the work in one go 
we don't want to have to run substitutions multiple times and like figure out when they stop substituting stuff. So our unification algorithm is going to calculate the most general unifiers, and those unifiers are going to be idempotent. And I won't prove it. So if anyone doesn't have any questions, I'm going to run through a unification algor algorithm. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Cool. So this is pseudo maths code. Hopefully, everyone can read it. A unifi a un the unify function is going to take a set of equations to a substitution, solution, unifier, whatever. And it's going to make every equation in that set a tautology. <coughs> so if we have the empty set, we're going to return the identity substitution. It's already solved. If we have a set where uh, a set that contains an equation between two base types, then we're just going to compare those base types for like definitional equality, like they're just syntactic equality, whatever you want to call it. If they are the same thing, then we're going to unify the rest of the equations. Otherwise, we're going to fail. If the set of equations contains an equation between two compound types. So I've denoted them generically here by like a constructor followed by n arguments equals another constructor followed by n arguments. The first thing that we're going to do is check the constructors for syntactic equality. So if you try to unify either and list, that fails just because they are not the same constructor. Then we're going to create a bunch more equations for each argument to the constructor. So assuming that those two constructors are the same means they're going to have the same arity, like they're going to have the same number of arguments. So we can generate n equations equating each argument with each other. Solve all of those. If the two constructors weren't syntactically equal, we fail again. In the case that we have an equation between a meta variable and something, we can already just consider that a solution. Sorry, yep. Yep, that's, and that's implied by the syntactic equality of the constructor. So if we're trying to solve an equation between meta and something, consider it already solved. I'm going to make a singleton substitution that maps meta to t. I'm going to do this occurs check, and we'll talk about that later on. All it does is it checks that the meta we have doesn't occur anywhere in that type. If that check fails, we fail. Otherwise, we unify the rest of the equations, but we've run the solution that we generated over all of them, effectively eliminating that meta we were working with from the rest of the solutions. It's like high school algebra. If you had a bunch of equations and you solved x, well, I, I, I would substitute for x everywhere throughout the rest of the equations. It makes everything a lot simpler. So we substitute our solution throughout the rest of the equations that we have, solve them, and then uh, we add S as the solution, as a solution in. The last case is that we have we have nothing that matches the above, so we swap them. And this lets you this really only lets you get the meta equals t case on the other side, and it was going to run off the slide. Um, otherwise I could have written t equals meta as the last case and we wouldn't have needed this one. So how is that algorithm for everyone? Yeah? All right, let's talk about the occurs check. Why? Let's start by considering some equation like this. I said earlier that the solution to this is really easy to generate. It's just you map that meta to bool. Um, and I can prove it to you by showing you what happens when we run that solution over both sides of the equation. We get bool out on both sides. Uh, but if we try some equation where the meta on the left-hand side 
occurs in the right hand side term. Let's try to make that a solution. Let's map meta n to ar meta n arrow bool. Well, it should be a solution, right? It should equate, it should make both sides equal. But if we run it, we made both sides bigger and we didn't solve anything. Um, and so if you omit the, the occurs check, you can get infinite terms in your inference. And that's why we need it. Now, there are some performance considerations here. The algorithm I presented m might be like n squared due to some things. Uh, the first one is that substitution is slow. So if I gave you a solution that maps metas to terms and I said, find every single meta variable in this term and run that substitution, I have to traverse a huge tree uh, and that's like order in, in, the, in the size of the tree. So we can get around that by using mutable variables for the meta uh, and that way a substitution is like a pointer update and now you might have like a billion terms but once you solved this meta, you solved it for all of them. You don't have to actually do any substitution. Uh, another similar solution along these lines is to use a thing called union find data structure. So that's a thing for maintaining equivalence classes. I'm not going to talk about it. It uses meta variables under the hood and uh, it has good time complexity for substitution like things. The other one here is that the occurs check is slow because again we have to traverse a term every time we want to, like we're searching for a single meta variable in a whole term. Um, and some solutions to that is by ignoring it. So some people have like wizard tech for dealing with infinite terms. I don't really know if that means anything in the context of like type inference, but I think that some of the logic languages might have something to deal with infinite terms. Um, the other one is to not do it at the site. Uh, there are some unification algorithms that treat your like type as a graph and then in places where you would have failed the occurs check, uh, the graph turns into a cyclic graph. So you do all unifications and you build up this potentially cyclic graph and then at the very end you do a topological sort and that's fast and it tells you whether there are any cycles, aka anything failed the occurs check. There's one last thing on this list, which is polymorphism. Uh, there were some cases that the inference rules I've presented you don't handle. So at the beginning I said uh, no metas should be present in the final type, but if I give you a term like this, it's going to infer you something that only has metas, zero constraints, you can never solve them away. So convince yourself via the proof tree. That's the constant function, it's something to something else to that first something. The way that we're going to get around this is by introducing type variables, which should not be confused with meta variables. But the core thing that we're going to do is we're going to abstract over any of those unsolved metas. So here's type variables. I'm going to use fancy Greek symbols. And we're going to extend our syntax of types again to use type variables. And these ones can be present at the end of type checking and the user can manipulate them. I'm going to introduce a new syntactical construct called a type scheme or a scheme for short. A type scheme is either a type or it's for all with a type variable and another scheme. So it kind of looks like lambda, but I've replaced lambda with for all. And this is how we're going to abstract over the type variables in a type. And I'm finally going to change the definition of contexts so that they map variables to type schemes and not types instead. Here's some examples of some type schemes. So for all A, A to A, uh, for all A, for all B, A to B to A, or alpha and beta. I'm finally going to introduce, well, I don't know if it's finally, but I'm going to introduce some more functions that compute the set of free variables 
free type variables in a type. So you can compute the free you can f compute the free type variables in a type by finding them all. I'm not going to show you how to do that in a type scheme where if it's a for all, we're going to compute the free variables in the thing on the right hand side of the for all and then delete the one that we saw from the result of that. Free means not bound, aka not bound by that for all. If it's just a regular type, get it out using free TVs of type. And you can also compute the free type variables in a context by going through every single entry and finding the free type variables of those schemes and unioning them together. One more function called instantiate. So the motivation for this is that we're going to potentially have type schemes in our context. And if we're presented with a type scheme during inference, we want to strip those binders off. We want to strip the for alls off. So instantiate, if it sees for all alpha something, it's going to generate a new meta. Then it's going to instantiate the rest and substitute that meta in. I just use this syntax because it's easier. So we're going to replace all occurrences of alpha or whatever it was with the meta we generated. And at the very end, uh, if you had like for all alpha, alpha arrow alpha, you might get like meta zero arrow meta zero. If you have a regular type, you don't need to do anything. Last function is generalize. So at the beginning, I said we're going to defer all of the constraints till the very end. That was kind of a lie. We're just going to defer them as long as possible. Um, and so I've just got this like syntax for we're going to solve all of the constraints necessary for the metas in this type. So if I had meta zero arrow meta one and I tried to solve that, it would just go as far as it could by following the equations that involved meta zero and one until we had no more solutions. Um, and what we're going to do after solving is we're going to abstract over the free type variables in our type that we're going to generalize. Except if there are some metas in that type, which is still in the context, we're going to exclude those from generalization. At the top, like if, you, if you're going to generalize a type you inferred for, say, a top-level definition, uh, the context might have stuff in it, but it's never going to have metas in it. Um, and so you could just omit that set minus, but if you're going to generalize like deep within a term, this becomes important. Um, no, because we don't, well, in this type system, we don't track the number of elements in a list in the type system. So it would be, generalize would be used to get a list of elements of unknown type. So a list of alpha or a list of beta. Um, so now I've introduced these cool functions for working with uh, type schemes. I'm going to update some of our inference rules. So the first one is uh, the inference rule for variables. Now that variables can have type schemes in the context, we need to instantiate those schemes if we want to infer a type for them later on. And uh, yeah, the next one is commonly included in these kind of presentations called let. You could do this kind of language without let and just have top level definitions and you would generalize those once you were done. But a lot of people include let to force generalization so let binding with a rule like this. I don't think I animated this one, no. But given an X and an E and a B and a context, let's infer a type for E. Now let's generalize that type and add it into our context and infer a type for the body of the let. Um, and doing this is slightly controversial in the PLT community. Um, some people disagree with generalizing it, but I've stayed true to the original presentation. So if you were type checking a top level definition and you didn't want to have lets, you would still do like a generalize at the end. I'm also going to present this cool one um, for those who want to do like the extension class or whatever. So this is let recursive. 
So if you notice for let, um, if I tried to use the name X within the body of E, it would have a scope error because I didn't add X into the context when I checked E. Uh, doing let rec does precisely that. And it's really cool and it's kind of like this knot tying thing. So um, let, rec X, let rec X equals E in B. The first thing we're going to do is generate a new meta. Then we're going to add X into the context and check E. It's kind of like the, uh, the lambda one because if I'm doing a recursive definition, I don't know what the type is until I've done it all. So type check E with X at some meta variable and you get an answer. Now you can say that meta N equals S and this is like tying the knot. Then we generalize S remembering that it solves the equations and type check the rest of it. Uh, definitely don't have to understand that, but I liked having it up here because it really confused me when I was uh, learning this stuff and I hope that uh, this can clear it up for some people who are at that kind of level. So there are some performance improvements you might want to do for um, this polymorphic type system. The first one is like batched or grouped instantiation generalization. So before I, I have like I had nested for alls and you can only name one variable in that for all, but you might want to name like a vector of them and uh, instantiate all of them at once or generalize over all of them. The other thing is that generalization is slow because you have to search through the whole context and collect up every single meta variable that's in the context. Um, you can get around this by using mutable variables again uh, with some cool trickery, but basically it pushes all of that generalizability information onto each meta itself. So when I say generalize this term, uh, all of the metas inside that term already know whether or not they're allowed to be generalized. And that's called lambda ranking and there's also let ranking. So um, that's the end of it. I hope that everyone, well, I hope that the people that are kind of inclined to these sorts of things have a concise, minus the animation slides I put in, like analysis of this. I learned it by reading Wikipedia a lot and then uh, trying to read the, the papers on Google Scholar and getting really confused. Um, so I've tried to create something that I would have found helpful then and um, hopefully you can pour over this later and it will like help you as you learn. Uh, I've got a couple of links here for things. The papers that I found really confusing, so you might want, not want to read them. Um, uh, Martelli and Montanari did a linear time unification algorithm, which is kind of like the one that I presented earlier. Uh, 